So this is cool. We got the world's biggest computer case fan, as far as we're aware. This is supposed to be large. We'll go over the size in a moment. This box, it literally has one fan in it for a computer. What we're going to do today is take this apart. It's from Corsair, actually. They built it, I think, for a joke. Uh, I took it seriously and emailed them and said, can we please have that to test it? And they said, we'll loan it to you. There's only one. So we're going to actually test this thing for real. And just to show you what it looks like, uh, it's massive. Actually, this times really well with our fan tester machine coming in because it's supposed to be arriving probably in the next week or two. I don't know if we'll be able to mount this to it. Uh, I, believe it or not, did not ask the scientific instrument company making it to accommodate a 500 millimeter fan. But we can try. In the very least, we'll stick it to the side of a case and see how it impacts things. This is fully functional. Uh, it is not a just a prop. Like They actually built a working fan. It will spin. And if you look at the back, it's got real specs on it. We'll talk about that in a moment. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly. Thermal Grizzly's Hydronaut and Cryonaut thermal paste are high-performing thermal interfaces for use on CPUs and GPUs. You can bring an old card back to peak performance by repasting it and doing preventative maintenance, and Thermal Grizzly's Hydronaut is ideal for water cooling and air cooling for new and old cards alike. Cryonaut paste is one of the top performing pastes for extreme overclocking with CPUs and GPUs and has been used in several world record scoring machines. Learn more at the link in the description below. Okay, so we're going to be testing this fan today. Uh, it actually needs some repair work where Patrick had started working on it and it's, it stopped spinning. He's going to explain why, talk about the problems. Corsair actually worked with the manufacturer for this. Uh, in order to get this fan fixed for our testing, we would have had to send it to Corsair and they would have had to send it to the manufacturer. So this wasn't just like an in-house prop made for an April Fool's video, which is really what it all seems like it was. Uh, it is, in fact, a functioning product. Let's verify the, the fan size, actually. Normally, I would use calipers to check on the size. But for this fan, we actually need a tape measure to check on the size. So we just do a simple full side to side. It's like 19 something inches. I'll get the millimeters in a second. Or if we just do the inner diameter, like 16 and three quarters, which I guess I'll just line this up on the mod mat to make it easy for myself. So we're like 490. What am I using? Yeah, okay, yeah, that's right. So it's it's all it's basically 500 millimeters. They're they're measuring outside, but you know for this since there's not a standard, I don't think we're worried about Corsair trying to make their fan sound bigger than it is. I. Uh, frankly, I think they're doing all right in that department. I, I don't think there's any exaggerated on this one. So it actually has foam bumpers here. It came with screws. Let me see if we have them. It came with this bag of cables and screws. See what they sent us. So that is actually super cool. This is kind of funny, this whole thing. I don't think I have a Phillips 27 or whatever that would be, but that's a very large Phillips uh, 3D printed screw. It unfortunately does not actually thread, but it's it's a cool attention to detail nonetheless. We've got some LED control here. We have the power. This is not a fan you can plug into your power supply. You definitely cannot plug this into your motherboard at all. It, it, if you adapted this to a three or a four pin, it would blow up the board in short order because at 12 volts and three amps, we're at 36 watts for one fan, which I guess is actually not that distant from some Delta fans, but uh, that's a lot of power. There's a speed dial here, got a nice click to it. So we'll test that. Let's see, wiring, so we've got 12 volt DC only. We have five strips for the outer ring. We have two strips for the fan hub. I wonder if all this stuff was on here or if they just labeled it because they knew we would be looking at it, and probably no one understood it but them at the time. It's actually sleeved. Like, I'm, the quality here is really not bad. If they turn this into a floor fan product and sell it at Lowe's, I wouldn't be surprised. RGB floor fan. So the hub's kind of falling off. I'm going to save that for Patrick to look at. That's just because we're trying to fix it. OK, so I think at this point what we're going to do, I want to pass it off to him to figure out why it doesn't spin anymore, what's broken in it. 
Uh, and then we're going to do some actual testing with it. So let's see if we can get this thing spinning. It's going to be really weird to use the tachometer on this, because we normally put a sticker on it and point a laser at it. And the amount of time required for one rotation on this will probably be very slow. So that'll be fun, too. OK, so Steve's asked me to take a look at this, do a post-mortem and, and unmortem on the fan. Um, the situation is that we got this in, and we set it up for testing, and it immediately started making kind of a uh, strange grinding noise. Uh, we didn't know what the internals were, and Corsair, I don't think, knew what the internals were either since they had um, another lab make it for them. So we were unsure whether that was just uh, an aspect of 3D printing a large project like this, uh, if it was supposed to sound like that. We asked Corsair, and we said, do you think that this would be fine to run for half an hour or so for thermal tests? And they said, sure. Uh, and then we, we tried that, and then after about 10 minutes, it stopped spinning and uh, released the dead electronics smell. So before that, it didn't really change in behavior at all. So whatever was wrong with it when it died, I think was wrong with it when we got it out of the box. So maybe something shifted in shipping. Uh, we're going to take a look and see. I have taken this label off before. We did our best to not stretch it out. Um, it was nice and tidy when it came from Corsair. I'm just going to lift this off to show you the screws under there. I think they're already all loose. Yeah. So this is how you access the internals. The gaffer tape is our addition. So there's these six screws here. So we've got the hub that's attached to the uh, fan and the fan blades here. And we've got a shaft going down here that has a belt around it. And this belt is being driven by this gearbox here, which is being driven by this motor here. Um, the belt, normally, I, we don't work with a lot of large machines that have belts in them. I think it would typically just be one belt. But since this is kind of a homebrew project, they've just used a bunch of tiny belts here. And... <laughs> It's worse than, a, than it was when I opened it up for the first time because I've fiddled around with it a little bit, but these belts are a little bit tangled around each other. And I think that might have been at least part of the problem here is that these belts were tangling and rubbing against each other and making this motor run a lot harder and hotter than it should have, and then it burned out. Hopefully that was the problem because we are going to put exactly the same motor and gearbox back in here. We looked up the QR code on here um, and went to the website and bought what should be exactly the same motor and gearbox assembly as just an off-the-shelf part. So unless something was epoxied together permanently in here, we should just be able to disassemble this and drop in the new part. Also, I should note that um, this is not the problem. <laughs> I caused this after the fact. These tabs had gotten brittle and I broke one of them off. But no, that's not the reason that it stopped running. Okay, let's put all this over here. So this is just a washer. This is a spacer collar. And this is some custom piece that they've machined that clamps onto the shaft. So underneath here, they have a ball bearing. Um, I should also mention this gearbox, for whatever reason, is intentionally designed to lock up when the motor isn't spinning. Uh, I think it's intended for use in, in vending machines and stuff. Maybe that helps with that. But it means that whenever you turn this off, the fan blades, they pull on the belt because this freezes up completely and the fan keeps spinning and it makes a really horrible crunching noise. Okay, so I, I think we've got this freed up now. Cool. 
cool. So it's just the belt holding it on at this point. Okay, so this is our gearbox and motor assembly. And these are the parts that we want to keep. We want to keep plastic. We want to keep this thing. We want to throw all this away. So we, uh, we popped open the gearbox and maybe you can begin to see something of an issue here. Hmm. We've got some beautiful gold powder here that used to be gears. So I think we've discovered that the grinding noise was not part of the intended function. So I'm just getting the belt straightened out. Okay, so it's, uh, it's working. Uh, again, it's working at least as well as it did when it got here in the first place. So I will do take two of our testing with the Sekura here and get those results to Steve and see what he thinks of it. Now that Patrick has mended the fan, we can move along to testing. Setup involved torturing our standardized case test bench with the horribly cooled MSI Sekura once again, a combination of expensive materials and some of the worst case design we've ever seen. We already know the baseline numbers for this case run right against TJ Maxx in some scenarios, so it'll give us plenty of room to drop the temperature. In other words, MSI has done what typically companies would charge a lot of money for, which is create an excellent test vehicle by making a a really bad case, but it's useful here. Testing will be done with the glass side panel removed for a control. We have the stock results that will show as well, but we also have a control with the side panel off and the fan in place, but turned off. We then turn the fan on to its maximum speed, allowing us to generate a true like-for-like -like comparison. All fan speeds were controlled for this extremely important and scientific test of a comically large fan because that's what we do. So for fan RPM, we just used a simple laser tachometer on the fan and measured the fan speed at full load. The replacement motor that we bought is the same as what was in there originally, and it's rated for 210 RPM at 12 volts, at least according to its Amazon page, but we measured about 280 to 290 RPM max with the tachometer. The RPM is variable, contingent on the dial on the back, which spins it down to about 100 RPM when at just one watt or so draw. For power consumption, we measured a fairly binary range of one watt or about 10 watts with little in between. At 280 to 290 RPM, it was a 10 watt draw. The motor itself is rated for 0.6 amps. So at 12 volts, that's just seven watts. Maybe this contributed to the motor burning out, but we're not sure. It might've also just been a need for more grease or something. At 100 RPM, it was about one watt. So it's definitely not a high powered fan. So here's how it turned out. This is our full system torture workload with just the CPU plotted first. The baseline torture test with the panel closed or the full stock test with zero influence from Corsair's concoction plateaued at around 68 degrees Celsius delta T over ambient. This is horrible and is one of the worst results from our case reviews, so again, Thank you, MSI, for providing the test vehicle for this benchmark. We'll show one of the case review charts as a reminder just to show you where the MSI Secura 500X landed compared to everyone else in the CPU torture results previously. Back to today's chart, the control, where the side panel is removed with the fans in place and off, was 61 degrees over ambient. That's a reduction of about six to seven degrees from the removal of the panel alone. Configuring the fan to run as intake drops it massively and just like the fan itself, comically. This is in some ways equivalent to putting a floor fan from a home improvement store right up against the case, except this one has RGB. The 48 degree result is a staggering 20 degree drop from the stock test or like for like, it's about a 13 degree drop. Not bad. We wanted to run this as exhaust as well, just out of curiosity for if it mattered, it would be pretty interesting actually but our replacement motor started making familiar noises. We suspect that the gearbox needs some grease 
And we didn't want to kill it a second time, so we stopped there since we technically need to send this back. Although hopefully Corsair forgets about it and lets us keep it because we want to try and strap it to our fan testing machine that's coming in. The chipset isn't that exciting in general and certainly isn't as thermally sensitive as the CPU, but it's passively cooled, so we thought it'd be interesting to look at it from direct airflow, potentially affecting it disproportionately. It also doesn't run as hot as baseline though, so there's less room to drop. The original torture result had it at 28 degrees over ambient, with the panelist control at 24 degrees. Adding the 500 millimeter intake fan brought that down another five degrees, down to 19 over ambient. This is actually a meaningful change and a large drop given the baseline temperature, uh, and it's difficult to replicate in the course of normal case reviews. We don't really see a change this large for the chipset this often. So that's pretty much gonna be it for the Corsair fan. It was fun to work with. It, wish we could have done a little bit more with it, but since the motors seem like they're gonna keep dying, it, it just, it seems like it needs a little bit more horsepower from the motors than what was provided by the original manufacturer. We replaced it like for like. Uh, if we were going to keep this thing and didn't have to send it back, we'd probably put a more powerful motor in there or something and just dial back the power a little bit. But anyway, that'll cap it for the Corsair fan. I just, as I was working on the conclusion for this video, got an email from our uh, freight carrier saying that our fan testing machine is actually in the vicinity now, and it's just a matter of receiving it. So hopefully we have the fan for long enough. I can hang on to it a little bit longer and maybe try to strap it to that thing, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not gonna work and we're not trained on it yet anyway, so the timing doesn't work out too well. But uh, once we know what we're doing with the fan tester, we'll try to work with Corsair to get the 500 mil fan back out here and see if we can hook it up to the tunnel. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching, it was kind of fun. Uh, unfortunate that it really seems to hate that motor, but we are curious if Corsair is planning to actually do something with this beyond what was obviously a fun joke when it first was posted. Thanks for watching, subscribe for more, go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. And we'll see you all next time.